Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, Is a Critical Friend the Key to Driving Change? My name is Lucy Wakeford, I'm Director of Programmes at Digital Leaders and it's my pleasure to be chairing this session. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd firstly like to recap the topic, just to give anyone who might be running late a chance to join. In this session, learn how the inclusion of a critical friend delivered innovative new ways of working, built on best practices, and developed a working model that delivers long-term benefits for the government department. The second thing I'd like to do is to let you know how to ask a question, which we encourage. Please enter the question in the Q&A window and I'll collect the questions during the presentation to ask in the Q&A in the last 15 minutes. The session will be fully recorded for you to watch back at a later time and share. I'd now like to introduce David Glassbrook, who'll be taking us through today's webinar. David has over 30 years experience managing the delivery of complex programmes and projects across an array of clients in both the private sector and central government. At Reed Professional Services, he leads their central government delivery team and is responsible for the end-to-end -end delivery of transformation projects for their public sector clients. David, time to hand over to you. Thank you, Lucy, and hello, everyone. As Lucy said, I'm David Glassbrook. I'm the central government lead for Reed Professional Services, which I've been doing for about five years now. Uh, 13, about 13 years altogether at Reed Professional Services. And today I'm going to take you through a case study uh, to show the role of a critical friend in driving change. Reed Professional Services are a boutique consultancy. We're part of the Reed group, part of the wider Reed recruitment group, and we focus on project delivery and digital development. And at this stage, I'll just uh, repeat that I'm a delivery lead, not marketing and sales. So um, apologies for the next slide, which marketing make me say, but this is the, this is the quick pitch about Reed Professional Services. So for the last 15 years, Reed Professional Services has worked with organizations like the Home Office, BBC, Barclays, Royal Mail Group, and the subject of this case study, DEFRA. Over that time, we've built a deep and valued relationships with the organizations, and our services range from providing complex project management to supporting business critical IT systems to software and application development. We've become a trusted partner in a wide variety of, of beneficial relationships and the backbone of many high profile projects. And it's the level of trust that exists between us and our client that's the cornerstone of our, our principles and our delivery. So the subject of our case study today is uh, DEFRA. So a quick introduction, many of you probably won't need it, but DEFRA is a ministerial department reporting to George Eustace, the Secretary of State has a relatively high number of agencies and arm's length bodies for the size of the department and compared to the core department and a very wide and evolving remit. And for this case study, we're focusing on the EU exit programme, the EU exit period. Um, I'll give more detail on, on the, the challenges in the next slides, but without a doubt, it was a, it was a major challenge and included significant IT development for, for DEFRA. So DEFRA had a very complex portfolio to deliver through EU exit, um, commonly referred to as the second most complex, I believe, or certainly up amongst the most complex for the, the government departments. There are some statements here from a National Audit Office report in December 17, which highlight the volume of DEFRA activity that was framed by EU legislation and the number of work streams that involved an IT development component. So to start off with, it had a, a complex and difficult job. Then some other factors that affected this and made it more complex, more difficult. So there's the high level of arm's length bodies involvement, 
and also uh, an ongoing restructuring between the core bodies and core department and the arms length bodies. A reducing headcount, so DEFRA headcount had shrunk, um, I believe, 18% since 2010, so significant reduction. And the restructuring of the Unity program had a, a relatively high level change to, to IT going on in the background as well that caused some problems. And the last, the last point is, is very significant, um, which was that DEFRA is a, has limited experience or had limited experience and capability in portfolio program and project delivery. So it's largely a policy department uh, without the experience that some other large government departments have of running major programs, major projects, day in, day out. So this was a very unusual challenge, EU exit. It was a, a daunting challenge and uphill task for, for the department. Having covered the, the scary bit, um, I'll just now talk a little bit about the concept of the critical friends. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, but I know it's it's more common concept in the education sector than, than in most others. So just a couple of slides to, to introduce the, the concept. So critical friend can be an individual or an organization. And in the case of this, this case study, it's both. So our consultants as individuals were critical friends and RPS in terms of the service we provided were acting as a critical friend to the organization. And we're there, a critical friend is there to speak difficult truths. So key aspects include truth and honesty, independence and expertise, and trust and respect. All of these are core values for, for read professional services, and we aim to always aim to act in this role with our, with our clients. So key concept of the critical friend is the differentiation between being a critical friend and being a critic. So I just want to pull out some of the, some of the key differences. So a critical friend will share the same objectives as the client, therefore leading to, to wanting to help, to positive, constructive criticism and suggestions. A critical friend will be qualified to advise, so will be talking from experience, having been there themselves. A critical friend will develop objective thinking and will always strive to be balanced and fair. On the other hand, a critic, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with some of these, will um, push negative feedback, will focus on flaws and what's wrong, and that will build resentment from both sides, can be very quickly, uh, and then entrenchment of that position, so it can escalate and spiral. Um, timing's important, so a critical friend will provide feedback with timing that allows for correction. And a critic will not always be balanced and objective. So now to move on to the, the specific case study, so DEFRA and EU exit and our support for them through, through that process. So as we've, as we've seen, DEFRA had major challenges with the EU exit and our engagement with them started in 2017. They asked us to help with raising the level of, of project and program expertise within the organization. And the, the high level approach, we put a call of contract in place, which covered commercials and the approach, but had no commitment. So no, no um, commercial commitment. There were, there were various framework choices and there were some changes. Some were, were cabinet office CCS frameworks and some not, um, but they all, they all had the same approach, which was to have the call of contract. And then underneath that was to have work packages, which were developed and agreed with individual areas, individual programs 
tailored to, to support their individual requirements and their differing capability or gaps in their capability often. The work packages define the deliverables, so define the scope, specific deliverables, success criteria, key risks and assumptions, and the commercials for that individual work package. And they're signed upfront by the SRO or the Workstream lead <clears throat> before we, and that's before we start work. We have a consistent delivery reporting and RAG status reporting, which is individually into the programs against specific work packages, but also consolidated across the whole of our, our service into the, the customer in, in commercial within DEFRA. And final points, quite important, was uh, the engagement included the gain share approach, which was there to ensure that we delivered value and to split any benefits of, of either early delivery or if we if there was an innovative solution that that um, reduced our costs in delivery then uh, we would split the benefits uh, and throughout the engagement the we were always looking to see whether we were still required so that sometimes triggered this there was always a a preference to use civil servants if they were available and had the capability and sometimes that happened during the work package in which case we would we would perform a managed exit and knowledge transfer so just looking a little bit more detail at our approach we have a, a standard proven process that we tailor when we we take on a major client like this and this involves a dedicated delivery team outside any of the work packages who are there to manage the overall service, to um, build the relationships with the stakeholders, to understand both the business needs, the processes, but also to understand the culture. This leads on to us identifying the, the challenges. And in this case, the main challenges were the, the depth and breadth of, of PPM support required and the speed of onboarding required. And the other, the other key challenge we had here was the a lot of the work packages, a lot of the work involved required us to integrate and collaborate with policy teams. So these were teams who weren't used to and often had never worked in a project and program environment. So weren't used to the language, weren't used to the skills, the tools, the, the controls. Um, so it was uh, that was one of the key challenges we faced. So the, having identified challenges and, and requirements for the individual stakeholders, we propose work packages to resolve those issues, meet the requirements. And crucially, the work packages allow us to take on an element of delivery risk. So because they're agreed and signed up front, they have defined deliverables with success criteria. Um, that allows us to take on some of the delivery risk and some of the responsibility for the, for the delivery. We would act, act as a critical friend during the work package delivery, both our consultants individually, but also us as a, as a service into DEFRA, trying to highlight the issues and what might need to be done to resolve them. And our dedicated delivery team provide ongoing management of the service, both dealing with any issues that occur, um, but also dealing with changes in requirements. So we're realistic about requirements all being defined up front, but they will change as, as a work package progresses. And our delivery team are very used to dealing with that scenario. So our initial engagement had three key strands. It was uh, PMO creation, portfolio planning, and program assurance. PMO creation, this, this was around creating a, a program management office to deal with the EU exit program. So there was, there was one didn't exist. There wasn't a PMO prior to this. Um, so this was about establishing a PMO. It later moved on to become the portfolio management office, covered the whole DEFRA group and extend, expanded to cover other programs. Portfolio planning is an interesting one, and um, I won't I won't go into that on this case study. It's that's possibly the subject of a whole other case study. Um, 
it was an area, it was a very new function in, in DEFRA and, and um, I had many interesting discussions about the benefits and approach to planning that were appropriate. So I think I learned quite a lot about that as well as client learning about it. So the case study is focusing on the programme assurance strand, which was around providing independent oversight of, of delivery. This slide, there's, there's a bit of detail on there, but these are the initial program assurance deliverables that were, were agreed with DEFRA. So it was developed very quickly. We had to start very quickly. Um, and it was a high level assurance role with a focus on discovery, prioritization and collaboration. The aim being to assess the position, identify priority risks and issues, and provide a consistent view of the, the current capability to help identify where support should be prioritized and where effort should be focused. So the four um, deliverables, the first one was around coaching and upskilling. It's a, it's a theme that runs through all of our work packages and engagements. We have standard approaches to ensure we complete knowledge transfer at the end, um, but this was, this was a key requirement for the, for the program assurance phase. Second one around project controls and tools, it rather than needing to ensure standardization, it became more a, um, a case of explaining the benefits and the reasons why teams should use them. So this, this was because of the, the mix of policy teams who weren't experienced with, with project controls and tools. Um, the, the third bullet is around delivery, so identifying barriers and facilitating support to, to ensure we're driving delivery. And the final one was around governance, which again was a, was a key issue during the programme. So there were very complex governance requirements, both internally within programmes, within DEFRA, um, but also externally. So the Cabinet Office, DEXU, there were, there were, it was a high level of governance requirements. Um, and it was constantly changing, which was a, a source of frustration for, for delivery teams. So we were there to, to assist with that. It quickly became apparent that more support was needed. Um, early 2018, there was a portfolio restructure and we changed to 64 projects in the EU exit programme. There were issues with understanding the status um, consistently. So programs and projects were reporting very differently. There was a high resistance to central PMO from policy teams and project delivery teams. And as I mentioned before, very low experience of, of delivery in, in complex environments. So there was a tendency to optimism so working with DEFRA, we expanded our assurance remit to introduce a delivery advisor service and a business partner service. So the, these were aligned to each director general command structure and provided the, the basis for, for them to become the, the critical friends to the delivery teams. So it was still an assurance and support role, not taking on direct delivery responsibility. That was with the project teams. We did have work packages in directly helping with delivery. Um, and there was also a, an interventions team that I'll, I'll talk about shortly. So the customer for these services was the PMO, but the teams were embedded in, in the work streams and the, the programs and projects. So the, the three strands became four strands, the delivery advisor service and business partner service replacing the program assurance. It was to develop the collaborative and supporting nature. So there's a, a, a high element of coaching, mentoring and upskilling requirements. The split between delivery advisor and business partner was really seniority and alignment. So the delivery advisors were more senior. They tended to be highly experienced program directors we were using, and they were aligned to SROs, work stream leads, um, Business partners were more embedded in the project teams, the delivery teams, and typically they were experienced project managers or project management consultants. 
So just looking at the delivery advisor service in a, in a little more detail. So they took on the program assurance role and deliverables, so that the four deliverables we looked at earlier. They were now clearly aligned to specific work streams and programs and had some added responsibilities and tools that I'll, I'll take you through. So I've mentioned business partners. The business partners were working for the delivery advisors and there were differing requirements based on the project volumes and the project complexity. So the delivery advisors had to justify the need for the business partners um, and they were responsible for them being successfully embedded and delivering successfully. So that was a, effectively a tool for the delivery advisors where required. The, there was a deliverable added for the delivery advisors, which was around program and project engagement. And this was really a, a recognition that the, the relationship between the PMO and the project teams was absolutely key and was very fragile. So the delivery advisors were responsible for ensuring the communication worked and ensuring that the PO, PMO remained value added and were helping the delivery teams actually deliver. There was another deliverable added for the delivery advisors. It's a lot of delivery, isn't it? But, um, the, it, became, it had become apparent that reporting was an issue. So consistent reporting across the portfolio. The delivery teams were interpreting reporting requirements differently. And there was a high level of um, optimistic reporting. So too many people reporting green because that's what they thought they needed to put. That's what they thought people wanted to see without understanding the call to action that an amber or a red can provide. So the delivery advisors were tasked with trying to normalize that reporting and the status of the portfolio by maintaining a detailed knowledge of the status and giving a feed directly into senior leadership team, the ops center, secretary of state um, of the status of the projects and the key risks and issues. And then, Another tool, the final additional tool to the delivery advisors was the interventions team. This was a, it was a separate work package to set this up and to run this, um, but the delivery advisors were key in helping to run it. So the interventions team was a, an emergency team that could be used, effectively parachuted into whatever area had the highest need. And the delivery advisors were key in helping to identify the need, prioritize it, define the requirements, what's the scope, what's the success criteria, facilitating the engagement if it was successfully signed off, and a key point is focusing on the exit. So there was a, a concern that once an intervention had started from the interventions team, the Tiger team, that it wouldn't finish, that the, the delivery team would become too reliant and they, they couldn't exit. So part of the delivery advisor responsibility was ensuring that exit was managed and was, was completed as per the original plan. Looking briefly at the organizational structure, uh, as I've mentioned, the delivery advisors and the business partners, they were part of that central PMO, but they had a foot in both camps. Uh, they were embedded with the, the delivery teams, the delivery advisors more senior, dealing with director generals, SROs, directors, business partners operating a slightly more junior level, the program leads, the, the program project delivery teams. The, the PMO transactional department still dealt directly with the delivery teams. So the planning teams, reporting teams, raid teams were working directly with the delivery teams, but the business partners and the delivery advisors were there to manage that relationship and ensure that it, it worked effectively and was productive. The, I've gone through the delivery advisor deliverables. These are the business partner service deliverables, but I won't go through in as much detail, um, mainly because I know it's um, probably between you and your lunch, most of you, so I don't, don't want to lose you. Um, the business partner service was is a concept very similar to, to one that I expect you're probably more familiar with, which is around business finance or HR business partners. 
Um, it's where you have an, an expert in your field, but they're there, they're embedded in there, they're there for you to, to, to help the business. Um, so fairly standard deliverables, a couple of pickouts to the fourth one down, I think, fourth one down um, was around identifying and helping to ensure interdependencies between the work streams, projects and programs are identified and managed. So we facilitated a working group of the business partners um, to ensure that that cross-project working was, was effective and where it needed to be. And the final bullet was key was around the business partners being the bridge between the PMO and the delivery teams. It was set by the PMO, as you can tell from the language. Um, I think the business units saw it the other way around, and I think our business partners um, navigated between the two. So a quick look at how we met um, Depo's requirements. So we have a, a talent pool of consultants, um, over 3,000 consultants that we work with repeatedly, so we engage with them. Uh, that means that we know them, they know us, they know how we work, and we trust as mutual trust. We, because of that, we have a high success rate of, of placing them. So we will understand the client's culture, we'll understand who would fit, and we'll, we'll um, find the right person to fit. In this case, for the delivery advisors and the business partners, it was it was an interesting challenge because they were working in a lot of different areas of the business with different requirements, different capability gaps, different teams on site. I've I've mentioned several times the lack of, of project and program delivery experience, but there were some areas that had highly experienced, highly skilled people. So that wasn't required there, but maybe some other some other capability was required there. So we sourced these um, experts from a, a variety of different areas, including private sector. It wasn't just central government project management and program managers just getting recycled and, and pushed back in. And these consultants became the critical friends that DEFRA needed to avoid key pitfalls and, and to deliver. So a few slides on the, um, the impact of the, providing the critical friends for, for DEFRA. So first key point, the program achieves its objectives. So we got it over the line. Um, DEFRA EU exit program completed successfully. They were ready for no deal three times. Um, I think it, it went over the line at Amber, I believe, but it went over the line. Our service grew, so through the, the call of contract, we provided uh, 169 work packages, all of whom were successfully delivered, and delivery includes um, sign-off by the, the stakeholder, so delivery acceptance, so we don't, we don't bill until we've um, had acceptance of delivery. So that 169 included the work packages for providing the delivery advisor and the business partner service, but, but obviously a lot of other, other services. DEFRA launched 11 new digital services, which was a, a significant um, challenge for them. And DEFRA extended the relationship with, with us through EU exit, after EU exit, and through COVID-19, recognising the, the value that that service brings. And then finally, I think I'd started with a, a National Audit Office quote. So, um, the final point on this slide is, is another another quote from National Order Office. Um, I think this was this was just prior to the EU exit, I believe the third time around, um, saying that DEFRA had done very well in difficult circumstances and despite facing challenge, the challenges outside its control, and it moved ahead with building IT systems needed. So just a summary of some of the success metrics um, of the impact of a critical friend on the, on the UX program. So there's massive IT system change compared to DEFRA's usual operating model. As I said at the beginning, DEFRA was not a department that was used to large complex programs and running um, IT system changes at anywhere near this level. 
the central PMO function and its development to a portfolio office um, was another key impact and another key benefit. So the portfolio office was established and developed to support and drive the change, the business change that's needed, rather than just being a monitoring order auditing center that, that PMOs can become if they're not effective. The critical friend service led to deep relationships lasting well beyond the project and the program engagement. So um, I know several relationships that are now have now converted to being just friendships, um, which is is lovely to see. And there, there was a quote there from one of the um, sorry from the, from the technical EU exit director Joe um, about the the way the internal digital skills have developed to to a new level. And finally, I'll finish on one of my personal highlights, which of my four years of working on in, in the area was um, going to a, a review meeting near the end of the programme with um, an EU exit programme director at DEFRA, who'd been a, a challenging stakeholder through the, through the programme. Uh, I was expecting robust, open feedback, um, and he told me that working with us on the service had been one of the highlights of his time on the program, which meant a lot to me. So thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much, David, for that insightful presentation. It's been really interesting to hear about the project and hear some of your learning and expertise. So thank you. We now have time for some questions. Uh, there are a couple that have been sent through, but as I mentioned, if you do have a question, please send that through to me now on the Q&A tab. Otherwise, you will have the opportunity to carry on the conversation later at publicsectorinsight.digileaders.com. So, David, I have a question here. To what extent was the critical friend element crucial to all the projects played? It's quite intangible as a service. What, what was the value? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. It, it is intangible uh, and difficult to quantify. I, I, I won't deny that. Um, in a, that's in a very similar way to, to any sort of standard program project assurance. It, it, it is difficult to quantify. I think the key, the key benefits are the, providing the confidence in the status and the outcomes. So I've mentioned before, there was one of the big challenges early on in 2017, 2018 was um, was not understanding where DEFRA needed to get to, that was reasonably clear, but understanding where it was and, and what its capability was in getting there. So um, I think the Critical Friends Service that Delivery Advisors Business Partners are absolutely key in normalising that understanding of what is the status, are we red, are we amber, where are the big problems, and um, have we got a plan for getting to where we need to be? That, Secondly, understanding risks, that's kind of related, but key risks and issues um, are all, that, that's a key, another key deliverable. Benefiting from others' experience, so not making the same mistakes others have, um, and allocating effort in the best, the best way possible. So I, I think the, the illustration of the benefit realized was, was the extension of the service, that the service was maintained, um, through to the end and DEFRA have actually following EU exit have sort of mirrored a similar type of thing in-house almost where they, they have a similar sort of critical friend type approach. Thank I you. That answers that one. I think it does. Yeah, thank you. So there's another question here. Is this a typical service you provide or is it required because of the situation? For instance, the EU exit. Um, it, yeah, that's that's interesting. It, 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 I would say it is fairly typical. Um, it's an extreme example in terms of the scale of the challenge, but in terms of the concept of the service, it is fairly typical for us in the project delivery space. Um, so I think it's fair to say there are a few organisations that have a steady project and programme demand. It, it's always variable, it's always up and down. Um, because of that, 
it's very difficult to build an internal capability and capacity that's exactly the right level to meet that demand. Uh, so we provide a very efficient way to, to, to resolve that. Um, so it is fairly typical that we will be in, involved in helping to meet the short-term peaks in capability um, or potentially capacity. Great, thank you. So another question, how did you find the resources and the people? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. It, it was tricky, mainly because of the level of, of change that all the other government departments and um, private sector were going through as well. So everyone was going through this. It wasn't unique to DEFRA. There was a, a requirement for these um, for the for these resources in, in other areas. Um, we, as I, as I mentioned, we have a, a trusted pool that we work with repeatedly, um, and they will generally um, prefer to, to work with us, so they'll tend to be available to us before anyone else, because of the way we work. Um, but we also have a wide wider network availability from our parents, um, from our parent group, Reed. Importantly, we, we pick the right people. So I think um, there was a huge level of demand, a very urgent level of demand, so, but avoiding falling into the trap of just putting anyone in um, was very important because that just generates more work and causes more problems. So we take the time to understand the culture and the challenges to ensure that we get the right person in who will fit culturally and will complement the in-house teams. And as, I, uh, as I mentioned in one of the slides, I think that often that um, meant thinking beyond standard central government project management resources, you tend to go round and round the, the merry-go-round between departments. And Final point on that, we, we manage the vetting and the screening in, internally within Reed, and we often would run that ahead of placing. So as soon as we were aware of a potential issue and requirement, we would start that activity so that once, once it's confirmed, we would be ahead of the game and ready to start very quickly. Um, in, in, in one case, I, I believe, if my memory is correct, it was a Friday to a Monday, so I agreed with the director we'd, we'd help them on the Friday and we had someone there on the Monday, which was, um, I think, the record. Pretty speedy, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so another question. What were the main challenges in rolling out so many projects? Um, I think I mentioned a couple of the challenges in, in the presentation, but I think a key one was the was the speed of the startup and the scale. Um, so this was, we, we started our first engagement with DEFRA, we were talking about sort of program assurance with a, a team of, of um, I think it was four to six people or something of that order. And it, I, I'll never forget the phone call, I think on a Friday afternoon where we, that changed to, to 120 people. <laughs> um, so it was a massive, a massive um, requirement. And to, to meet that, we, we mobilised an internal team to deal with both the delivery side, so the engaging with the stakeholders, understanding the requirements, but also dealing with the, the selection and the onboarding side, So, uh, uh, um, which was, as I've said before, was very competitive due to the, the ongoing demand. But um, that, that, I think, was, was the key challenge. Great. And then one final question from me, then. How many critical friends did you have and across how many projects? Um, so it, it varied slightly through the life of the service. The service ran for, for many years. So um, the and the, the picture in terms of the, the programs and portfolios was changed slightly as, as life went on. So the requirements were changed slightly, but the average was, I think we had five delivery advisors and seven seven to ten business partners um active at, at any time um overall in terms of the projects i think we we peaked at um over 100 i think it was 110 consultants on site um to, just to show the sort of scale of the other the other projects that were involved but yeah the the critical friend component the delivery advisors and business partners was was around sort of 10 to 15. 
Okay, excellent. Well, we are almost out of time. So thank you all so much for tuning in and thank you so much to David for such an interesting and informative session. The recording of this will be on publicsectorinsight.digileaders.com on the same talk page that you registered on. And you'll also be emailed a link to the recording later on today. And you'll be able to share that link with colleagues and watch it back at your leisure. Thank you so much again to David and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you all.